Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andy Sterling. Welcome to our Personal Protective Equipment webinar. Uh, this is PPE as it relates to general industry, or subpart I. In this course, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the general requirements for PPE, how to conduct a basic hazard assessment, which is the basis of selecting our PPE, as well as recognizing basic hazard categories and understanding PPE essentials. So PPE essentially is the equipment worn to minimize exposure to hazards in the workplace. Now remember, I always try to tell people PPE is always a last resort. It's never the first thing that you turn to. It's always the last resort. If you can eliminate the hazard, that's the best. Maybe you can minimize the hazard using engineering controls or administrative controls and thus eliminating the need for PPE. That's even better. But the last case scenario, very last, should be using PPE. Now, this can be hard hats, gloves, goggles, hearing protection, but again, you know, it's a temporary measure. We're only using it while we're being subjected to the hazard. Now, in general, PPE needs to be provided and used and maintained in a sanitary and reliable condition. Nobody wants to use a dirty respirator. Nobody can see through dirty glasses. And nobody wants to use earplugs, uh, maybe that someone else has used and they have a chunk of earwax on them or something like that. So make sure that your PPE is clean. Clean your PPE whenever it's necessary. If that's every day, if you work in a really dirty environment, well, then it is what it is. Maybe it's not such a dirty environment, maybe it's just very dusty, and maybe you clean it once a week. But whatever you choose to do, you need to make sure that you keep that in a sanitary condition. And also, keeping it clean gives you the opportunity to go through that piece of PPE, look at it carefully, and maintain it. You know, maybe uh, there is a filter that needs to be replaced. Maybe there's a butterfly valve in the respirator that needs to be replaced. Maybe there are more scratches on your glasses than you realize. You just thought they were dirty. Actually, they're you know, very scratched up, so you might need to replace them. And whatever the case, you need to remember to keep that PPE sanitary and reliable. Now, a lot of employees will provide their own personal protective equipment, but it's up to the to the employer to make sure that not only is that equipment ANSI certified and proper for the job site that you're working on, but it's also important for you to remember you need to make sure that they're keeping up that as well. So if they have the excuse of, well, you know, these are my safety glasses, this is my hard hat, uh, I'm going to keep it however I want to. Not really. That's not the case. It's up to the actual employer to make sure that these things are functional, clean, and have proper maintenance done to them. Now, all PPE needs to be designed for the job it's going to do. So if you're going down into this confined space like this fella, he has a baseball cap. I'm sure it's a very nice baseball cap, but a baseball cap is not going to cut it. He should have a hard hat, okay? Not a bump cap, not a floppy brimmed hat, not this kind of hat, an actual hard hat that's going to protect his head. Now, if you look at this case, is actually I see a lot of really good things going on. You know, the uh, worker has a harness for rescue and there's you know proper tension on the line it looks good there's ventilation in there so a lot of things look good with this but the thing I don't like is he's not wearing a hard hat plus two I don't know if he actually uh, checked that area with a gas meter before he went in or if he just decided to ventilate and it would be fine the way that it was 
one big requirement we have to remember when we're selecting PPE is that that PPE needs to properly fit and we also need to talk to the employees and tell them, okay, these are the hazards that you are facing and so this is the PPE that we got. So when you're selecting that PPE, you need to talk to your employees. Let them assist you with the assessment. Talk to them. Talk to them. Because a lot of times they're going to have input on the scenario that you don't necessarily have. You know, you may go out there and look and do a great hazard assessment, but you may not see all the hazards that they see on a day-to-day -day basis unless you're actually one of the employees that's doing that work. A good way to make some of these decisions is referring back to your injury and illness logs. You know, do you have a trouble spot? Do you have a place that you see lots and lots and lots of issues? Okay. Have there been multiple accidents in this part of your company, on this section, in this department? Uh, those will help you a lot. Maybe it's the same piece of equipment. You know, all of these things, if you look at the results and you look at the actual numbers, they can help you come to a conclusion. Also, take into account your safety data sheets. Your safety data sheets are going to be a great guide, especially if you're working you know, with a hazardous chemical, as to what sort of safety equipment you're going to need to protect yourself against the hazards of that chemical. Uh, remember, every chemical is unique. There's not a one-size-fits-all chemical, so it's important to look at all the chemicals on your site and decide on PPE for addressing those. Now some may require very specialized PPE and there are others that a more general, uh, say a glove, a more general glove may offer you protection for you know a number of different chemicals even though you may require a specialty pair of gloves for handling a couple of different chemicals. Now, when we do that uh, hazard assessment, it has to be job and area based. It's not really a one size fits all. Now, a lot of times we do come into that situation with something like, say, residential construction. A lot of the hazards on a residential construction site are the same regardless of what subdivision they're working in. A lot of those are the same. However, some residential housing, especially if you're doing custom housing, you can run into some very unique situations because there's a lot of custom houses now and uh, multi-million dollar houses, I've seen many of them in the triangle, that actually incorporate a lot of commercial building techniques. Uh, you see a lot of steel and a lot of uh, brick and block work and stone work that you don't typically see in a regular traditional stick built house. So again, sometimes there are unique situations even with something like that. And that's why we tell uh, employers, make sure that you do an assessment of the workplace itself and don't just think, oh, well, you know, they're all the same, because they're not. Each one is a little bit different. Now, we have to have required, or one of the things we require is we have to have written certification showing that you actually did this. You know, it's not punishment. You're not having to take a test. What this is, is it's a tool. It's a tool that helps you organize your thoughts. Just like if you write a paper when you were in school, uh, you know, your teacher would say, hey, you need to write an outline first because an outline is going to help you organize your thoughts. And that is exactly what this is for. Organize your thoughts, figure out what the hazards are in the workplace, and figure out how you're going to address those. Make sure that you date it and write down the person that's actually doing the evaluation. Now, there's a number of ways to do an evaluation. You can do a walk around. That's what I suggest is always everybody's first angle of approach. Walk around the site. Look at it. What are you doing? What are the hazards that you see? How are you going to control those hazards? What kind of PPE are you going to choose? So there's a lot of different basic hazard categories 
that we look at, you know, is this a chemical that they're going to be exposed to? Or is it some sort of impact or penetration from, say, a saw blade or a cutting blade? Is the hazard maybe something to do with electricity, electrical shock, possibly arc flash? Maybe there are extremes in, say, heat or cold or wet. All of those different things have to be addressed. Electrical arc is very dangerous, right? We see a lot of dangers from that because people, uh, instead of complying with NFPA 70E and arc flash uh, protection, they say, well, you know, I'm going to shut this down and, you know, it's not going to be a big deal. However, you forget about the part where you actually have to test that circuit once it's shut down to verify that it actually is shut down. And we have had cases where people have gotten injured very badly or even killed when they are actually testing a circuit to see and verify that it has been shut off and they drop a tool and it hits other components in there and they end up getting an arc flash and you know getting killed. So follow NFPA 70E when it comes to arc, electrical arcs and arc flash. Air contaminants are another one, dust, mist, fumes, these are a big one that we address all the time, uh, especially in things like construction, we see a lot of silica issues. However, we see those in general industry too. Um, folks that cut granite for countertops, tombstones, walkways, paths, decorative granite, things like that. They're doing that work in a warehouse, and they are subjected to it as well. So in many cases, some of that falls under construction, but in many cases, it falls under general industry. So you need to remember that something like silica, it's not just a construction problem. It's everybody's problem. If you're dealing with cutting any sort of stone, then there can be silica particles, and you are subjected to that. Light radiation is another one. Falls, we see falls all the time in both general industry and construction. So it's important to address all of these things. Now, once we've selected our PPE, training is key. What is the PPE are you using, and how are you going to use it? How do you put it on? How do you take it off? How do you adjust it? How do you wear it? How do you maintain it? How do you clean it? Uh, what are its limitations, you know? Wearing PPE is not the same as wearing, say, a suit of armor, and uh, you know you are not absolutely impenetrable, and you are not uh, absolutely impervious to harm wearing PPE. PPE will protect you, but you have to know what the limitations are. Yes, if a brick falls from, say, uh, you know, six or eight feet and hits your hard hat, you're going to hear it. And, you know, it might sting you for a second. Not that big a deal. If a brick falls from, say, 200 feet from multiple, you know, floors up, if that hits you in the head, it's probably going to break your hard hat. So, again, you know, a drop from several hundred feet versus a drop from just a couple of feet, very different. And there are limitations to the PPE that you're wearing and what it will do. You also need to know when to replace it because it may be damaged and it you know, may be to the point where you need to make a drastic change. And If that's the case, you need to get that done. And a lot of people don't know when to replace their PPE. They just look at it and it may look absolutely fine. But we've seen many cases where we've had a harness or something like that where on the outside it kind of looked okay, but then when you actually moved it around and tried to flex it, a lot of the fibers are dry rotted in it because it was you know, 30 years old and had been out in the sun the entire time while this person was wearing it. They were just lucky enough they never took a fall in it. So, and especially if you're buying something used and you see a lot of uh, construction workers and a lot of folks in general industry will wear used PPE. And if it's something that's used, it's got a lot of mileage on it already. All right. So the employee needs to demonstrate to you that they have knowledge and skill. So that means after you teach them how to use, say, something like a half-mask respirator or maybe a harness for PPE, have them show you how to do it. 
one of the best methods for verifying that a person knows what they're doing is to have them teach it to you, right? And that way you can verify, yeah, this person knows what they're talking about or no, they're just kind of faking it. If that's the case, you need to make sure that you're working with them and get them up to speed. On that note, if you do see a deficiency in their learning, you need to retrain them and retrain as necessary. With PPE payment, it's up to the employer. The employer has to pay for all PPE that's used in the workplace. There are some exceptions, which are seen here. Uh, Non-specialty safety footwear um, or non-specialty prescription safety eyewear, all right, uh, provided by the employer. Uh, if he allows it to be worn off the job site. So let's say you've got... Um, you require your guys to have safety shoes. Well, you know, they wear their safety shoes on the job site, off the job site, in their truck, you know, where they go, different places. That's one thing. If you have, say, a chemical plant where they have boots that they have to wear, you know, uh, like chemical boots, you know, waders that they have to wear as part of their PPE, and they put those on, and then they rinse them off, and they take them off at the end of the day and leave them you know, back uh, in their lockers, then, you know, those are, that's PPE that you need to purchase because it is not meant for take-home use, all right? And there are some other ones, logging boots and built-in metatarsals. One big one that we have a lot of questions about is regular work clothing. So work clothing and ordinary clothing, right, that you just wear day-to-day, -day, uh, yeah, the employer does not pay for that, okay? Uh, if you are a construction worker or you work in a plant and you just wear jeans every day, no, your employer doesn't pay for your jeans. You pay for your jeans. Now, if they have something like coveralls for you to wear and they have a cleaning service, that's different. They're taking care of that. They don't have to, but they are. But when it comes to things like jeans and T-shirts and things like that, that's up to the individual. Same thing with like skin creams, uh, suntan lotion, uh, sunscreen, stuff like that. Uh, payment, employer has to pay for replacement PPE unless it's lost or if it's, you know, intentionally damaged. Uh, and the PPE needs to provide adequate and appropriate PPE. Now, if the employee prefers a different type, the employer doesn't have to pay for it. So let's say you provide, uh, let's say sunglasses, right? Let's say you provide tinted eyewear for a construction site. Or maybe they're not even tinted, but they're just safety glasses for your construction site. And one of your workers decides that he wants a nice, cool pair of Oakleys, um, you know, that are, you know, sunglasses that are also safety glasses that he can use uh, on the job site because they look cooler and maybe he likes them better and they're more comfortable, whatever. That's fine, but you don't have to pay for those. He pays for those. Now, the employer is responsible to make sure that they are ANSI certified before he lets them on the job site. You can see here we've got a fellow that's welding. Welding's a great example of eye and face protection because this is a very, very unique um, situation because with welding you have uh, injurious light radiation, right? And it's not just light radiation. Obviously, eye and face protection does a number of things. It, it protects us from flying particles, number one. When you think safety glasses, most people think something flying up into your eye, a nail, a staple, sawdust, piece of wood, a splinter, all kinds of different things, a chunk of metal, molten metal, uh, metal shards, right? If you're using a grinding wheel, uh, little sparks come off of there, little bits of metal. And then if we're using chemicals, we think about chemical gases, vapors, acids, caustics, uh, and then just organic chemicals that, you know, will burn if they get in your eye. All of those things we have special PPE for. Now, if you look in the picture here, you can see, uh, say like with welding, you know, here's a couple of pairs of welding goggles. The pair on top, they're nasty. And the pair on the bottom, 
that's a good example. It shows you what the shade numbers are. Because remember, you want to get something that's appropriate for the actual work that you're doing. So I always encourage people, make sure you're selecting the proper PPE. I cannot emphasize that enough. And then once you get it, keep it clean. Because we can see here with this example, you know, this is really gross. And people aren't going to want to put that on their face. And what happens is it's probably a community pair of goggles as well. So that means you've got different people that are wearing them. If people can have their own PPE, that's a lot better because there's more of a chance of people wearing something that is theirs as opposed to wearing something that they have to share with someone else. I mean, you know, think about it. One of the big things now that a lot of nurses are having issues with is with masks because now in this current um, coronavirus uh, atmosphere that we're in, uh, because our supply lines are stretched so thin because of the pandemic, uh, a lot of nurses are having to reuse masks. And a lot of those masks get collected at the end of the day and they are sterilized and then handed back out. Now, that sounds really good, but you know, it's just like not everybody has the same oral hygiene, right? And so, you know, you may have your mask that, you know, you've been wearing and you feel pretty confident in because you know where your face has been. But then you get someone else's mask, and even though, yes, it's been sterilized, you're still kind of like, yeah, yeah, I don't know where that person's face has been, right? So, Community, PPE, a lot of times people won't wear it because they're very wary of it. And if it's in this kind of condition, they're definitely not going to wear it. So keep it clean. Keep it clean. Light radiation can be extremely dangerous to unprotected eyes. We always try to encourage folks uh, to wear the proper PPE anytime they're going to be subjected to some sort of light radiation. Now, the number one light radiation that we think of is something like welding, okay? And so people say, oh, I wear my welding helmet, whatever. And that's fine. But a lot of times, especially nowadays, we have a number of different cutters and we have a number of different systems that use lasers. And one thing I try to tell people is, is that um, I know like in the university, uh, when I was at NC State, uh, we were very stringent and we had many different pairs of laser goggles in, um, say, our physics department uh, or different engineering departments, where if we were using lasers, we had to wear those goggles and use the appropriate goggles to protect our eyes. And the thing is, is that different la lasers operate in different wavelengths, and so you have to have specific goggles to protect you at those wavelengths. And a lot of times, uh, you know, uh, an engineer or scientist, they're going to know this, and they may enact it, but an operator in a plant, you know, they may not know that. They may just, you know, be like, ooh, that's really cool, but they don't really know what the laser does and how it works and why it's different wavelengths, and they may think that just wearing a pair of sunglasses is protection enough, which we know it is not. With this fellow, we can see he's doing some cutting, and he's cutting stone. When you're cutting stone, there's a number of different factors. So we see... You know, he has a pair of gloves, which could be great, um, but he also has uh, a face mask. And hopefully that face mask is fitted properly. Maybe it's an N95. I'm not sure what it is. But when he's cutting this, if he's using a saw like that to cut stone or brick, it needs to be a wet saw, and it needs to have water on it. Now, will it cut dry? Absolutely. It will burn the blade up, too, very quickly. However... It also throws a ton of dust. Water does two things. One, it cools the blade. Two, it keeps dust down. So anytime you're using a tool like this, it's important to make sure that you're using it correctly. Again, this is another example of using engineering. If you use engineering controls with a saw like this, you may not have to have a respirator, especially if you're working outside. And if you do have to have a respirator, it will be a minimal amount of protection. Now, our employers need to make sure 
that if we have employees that wear prescription lenses, right, they wear, lenses, or they wear glasses, that they have protective eyewear that can be worn over those lenses. So uh, a lot of folks that wear glasses will wear a pair of goggles that will protect their glasses uh, and, you know, provide them protection. Some folks actually have prescription safety glasses, which are definitely a thing. You can purchase those and use those, and a lot of employers will actually provide those for their employees. Whenever we're selecting any sort of eye protection, we need to make sure that it's ANSI approved. And you can see with ANSI Z87, that's the kind of approval that we're looking for. It's important to remember any PPE that you have will have this ANSI label on it. And the ANSI label, there are several different types, and as we go through our presentation, we'll see some of those different ones. This one's the first one, which is ANSI Z87, probably the most popular because, uh, you know, just about everybody, regardless of what they do, at some point, they'll probably wear a pair of safety glasses in their working career. Now with hard hats, hard hats are designed specifically to protect your head from injuries due to falling objects, right? Something falls from the sky, hits you in the head, your hard hat gives you protection. A cap won't do that. A bump cap won't do that. But a hard hat will. There are a lot of different types of hard hats made of a lot of different types of materials. Some hard hats are made from plastic. You have some hard hats that are far more durable that are made of things like fiberglass and impregnated uh, duck cotton that is molded into a hat and then fiberglass. You see a lot of construction workers will wear those, especially steel workers. And then you also see, you know, metal hard hats from back in the day, right? You still see some loggers wearing those from time to time. They're made of aluminum or tin, something like that. But it has to be an approved hard hat. Now, some folks, if you are working uh, with electricity, you can see here we have a number of different PPE items that are very specific to electricians. Now, we see they have insulated shoes, they're on insulated mat, they have insulated gloves, they have special shirts that are designed uh, not to catch fire, that they'll just smolder and protect the uh, wearer from burns. But did you know their hard hats are also, also designed so that they can reduce electrical shock? So if you have employees that are going to be working with or near electricity, it's important to make sure that they have the proper hard hat for the job. Now, higher hat criteria follows ANSI Z89, and we can see right here several different versions, Z89, uh, 2009, 2003, 1997. Each one of those is when the standard changed a little bit, just slightly, but it has to have one of those codes in it, okay? So it's important to remember. Now, some people will ask, hey, uh, do I have to replace my hard hat every 10 years? Uh, do I have to replace it, you know, because NFPA said, you know, we have to replace bunker gear every 10 years. And that's true. For a firefighter, NFPA did make the mandate that you have to change your bunker gear every 10 years. That was not OSHA, okay? That was NFPA. OSHA's stance is if it is a serviceable piece of PPE, and it is in good condition, it can be used. So that's the criteria. Now footwear is another one where we see a lot of folks out in the industry, uh, we've seen a big change in footwear. It used to be anytime you had safety shoes, uh, they either looked like a very awkward dress shoe or it looked like a boot. Today, there are so many different types of safety shoes out there. There are safety shoes that look like tennis shoes. There are safety shoes that look like uh, dress shoes. I've even some the, uh, seen some ladies' safety shoes that, that are mules, right, where they're a slip-on safety shoe. I've seen safety shoes that look like 
traditional boots. I've seen Doc Martens safety shoes. I have seen which, you know, actually Doc Martin started off, it originally was a safety shoe uh, before it became a, a fashion thing, right? Um, but I've seen a number of different styles and patterns. But remember, when you're selecting safety shoes, no matter how stylish you want them, you need to make sure that those safety shoes are designed for the purpose you're using them for. So if you are designed for the purpose you're using them for. So if you are working in a very uh, wet environment, you know, you may need something that is more water resistant or waterproof, right? Maybe has a Gore-Tex lining. If you're working in a place where there are a lot of sharp things that you're going to be walking on, you may want to have a steel shank, right, to protect you from things like nails or sharp uh, objects poking up through the bottom of your shoe. Some workers need to have metatarsal protection. Metatarsal protection is very important. In fact, you know, if you look at these, these actually provide both metatarsal protection as well as toe protection. There's a lot of different ones out there, and there are even some that will mitigate uh, for electrical hazards, right? Uh, they will uh, dissipate static discharge or shock, and that's important. Simply, all that means is they're insulated. They're insulated boots. So make sure you choose the right safety shoe for the job. Now, safety shoes fall under ANSI Z41, and we can see here, here's ANSI Z41, 99, 91, and 2005. These are important numbers to remember. Also, look at your safety shoes. Are they in good condition? You can see here, this fella, you can see the steel toes poking through where the leather's worn off his boots. Maybe time for a new pair. Now, there are a lot of other bits of PPE out there that are very specialized, right? They're very, very specialized for special jobs. Electrical is a great example. Here we can see a number of different uh, electrical gloves, and we can see, you know, there are different tables that show, uh, you know, have different proof tests, right? So when we're looking at uh, arc or AC proof test voltages uh, for different PPE, that means these provide a certain amount of insulation based on the amount of electricity they're being subjected to. So it's important that you make sure you choose the correct handwear for that. Now, when we talk about hand protection, there's a lot of different versions of hand protection out there. Now, with this, we can see here, these are specialized. Okay, very, 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 very specialized. And I might say very, very, very expensive too. And they are designed specifically for working with electricity. These gloves are more general. They're just Buna N rubber, and they are designed for working with chemicals. They're impervious to a lot of different solvents. And this guy looks like he is using solvent to strip a piece of furniture or clean some piece of equipment. Uh, but, you know, we use solvents for a lot of different things, and that's a typical get-up uh, if you are using solvents, where you have an apron and you have a splash uh, a face piece and you have gloves with gauntlets. Remember, gloves protect our hands from abrasions, cuts, lacerations, extreme temperatures, abrasions, and burns. How do we select our PPE? Well, it has to to be relative to the task that's being performed and the conditions that task is being performed in. One thing I always remind people is that the SDS sheet is a crucial, crucial part of choosing this if you are using chemicals. Now, a lot of times we'll wear gloves and we're not using any sort of chemicals at all, right? But if we are using chemicals, then we really have to consider using that SDS sheet to make the right choice. Now there are some, there's some PPE, some gloves out there that we can choose that are very good do-it-all, right? They do, they'll do everything. They're absolutely fine for using uh, with solvents 
and a lot of different chemicals and a lot of different types of solvents. There are some gloves that are very specialized. It's important to choose a glove that's going to address the issues that you have in your workplace. Okay? So, uh, when I was ordering gloves, I would always order something a little bit beefier than probably the minimum that I needed. That way, if I got something else in, you know, I'm, there was a chance that I could use that glove for more than just the chemicals that I had on site. If I brought something new in, I might be able to use it for that too. But again, that all depended on what the chemical was and what I was using. So, one big part of PPE is obviously our personal fall protection. And we use personal fall arrest systems. Most of the time we see these, we think of them as being in construction and only construction. However, we use them a lot in general industry. We use them a lot in general industry, especially when we're walking on things like catwalks uh, or in high elevated spaces in, say, warehouses when we're picking products, or even if we're working in high spaces, say, where there are reactors. I can remember when I worked in the chemical industry as an engineer, and uh, you know, a lot of our reactors, especially our big five and six thousand and ten thousand gallon reactors, you know, you would have to walk up uh, a few flights of stairs to get up to the top of that reactor. And while you're up there, you might need fall protection. So, you know, a lot of these areas had sufficient guardrails, but a lot of them, if you were doing repairs on the tanks, you would have to get out of the safety of the area with the guardrail and good footing and you would actually have to crawl around on the tank and if you slid off of that tank you would be in really rough shape. So one way to address that situation is wearing personal fall protection. You can see here this guy's dangling from his PPE. This is used for rescue in say a confined space. You can see the davit that he's hooked to. It's really important to remember that these lifelines have a minimum breaking strength of 5,000 pounds, right? And the reason for that is not because of the weight of the person. Remember, we're talking about force. So force equals mass times acceleration. And weight is just a description of force because weight equals mass times acceleration due to gravity. So when we look at that equation, it says W equals mg. So g is acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. So our weight, say on this planet, is essentially the force of gravity on our mass as we're standing in one place. Not jumping in the air, not doing anything else, but just standing. So if we take a fall, that amount of force is going to be much, much, much greater. So think about if you lay a quarter on a table. It just lays there, right? Just like if you're standing, you're just standing there. Now take that quarter, lift it three feet above the table in your hand, and drop it back on the table. What happens? The quarter will hit the table, and it'll bounce, and it'll flip, and then it'll land again. Same is true if you take a person. If a person's standing on a sidewalk, and then you lift them, say, 30 feet above that sidewalk and let them go, when they hit, they're going to hit with an accelerated force. And when they do hit, it's going to do great harm to them or maybe even kill them because it is much more force because the difference in potential energy. Laying on the table or on sitting, standing on the sidewalk, that's zero potential energy. If you're up several feet in the air, that increases your potential energy. And that potential energy has to equal the kinetic energy or the energy that's expelled when that object hits the surface, whether it's a tabletop or a sidewalk. So it's very important to make sure when we're doing these things, we have to have proper PPE that is designed for that braking strength of 5,000 pounds. That's why just using some old a uh, piece of rope is not going to cut it. One thing too to look at this is that the maximum arresting force is limited to 1800 pounds and in order to achieve that 
we have to have a decelerator that's no more than three and a half feet. And when I say arresting force, that means the amount of force that's exerted on that body to when it comes to a stop. So, you know, again, this is why we're not using just some old piece of rope and we fall like, you know, we're on a 200 foot building and we fall, you know, 40 feet. That's a tremendous amount of time for us to build up a lot of energy and then come to a sudden stop. If we only went three and a half feet, that'd be a lot less of a shock to our body. If we were using a retractable and we only went a couple of inches, that'd be a whole lot less. We could probably just stand right back up and start working again. And retractables, I cannot emphasize enough, that is such a great way to go. Such a great way to go. So when we're looking at uh, personal fall arrest systems, one thing to think about as well is that uh, body belts. Body belts are prohibited as part of personal fall arrest system. Now there are uh, personal fall arrest systems that are a uh, an actual harness and it will have a body belt component built into it. That's okay. But just using a body belt by itself as PPE, you can't do that. It's really important to remember that when we're using a body belt, okay, that body belt, we are only going to be leaning out a, away from something that we're working on and we're connected to that. It could be a lineman working on a pole. It could be a steel erector that's working on a piece of rebar. But again, that's all the force that's going to be applied on that belt. So one thing with positioning systems is remember those positioning systems they've got to be designed so they can withstand without any failure a drop test of four feet on 250 pound weight. So you know you think about that that's like you know a person if they were to slip and fall they're not going to fall more than four feet with that. Now when we're looking at say window cleaners, window cleaners uh, they have a very special uh, exemption here where they actually have to be able uh, to withstand uh, a drop test of six feet with a, a weight of 250 pounds uh, without failure at all. You also have to limit that arresting force to 2,000 pounds and it can't be a duration exceeding two milliseconds, right? So that means it's not a slow period, but it's just sudden fall, boink, just like that. With alignment, you know, we have uh, body belts that they use and pole straps. Again, those are designed for linemen, and with linemen, you're worried about electricity. So they have an electrical component built in where you are doing a flammability test as well. Now, to summarize, we covered general requirements uh, and general hazard assessment in PPE. Uh, there is one PPE essential that we have not gotten to that I'm going to address now. And to do that, we're going to go to live video. So bear with me for a minute. And we will switch over. Hello. So. One big thing that I want to share with you today is a lot of talk about respirators. Respirators are also PPE. Here we've got two different kinds that uh, I'm sure you've seen on the TV. Uh, these are N95 respirators. This one has an exhalation valve. You can see that up close. And see it from the back side here. Okay. And this one does not. They're made of the same material, just this one has the valve. That exhalation valve, all it does is when you breathe out, it lets warm, moist air out of the mask as opposed to collecting and having to push through the actual filter medium like it would in this mask. It just keeps the mask from becoming saturated with moisture from your breathing. Okay. I want to mention a couple of things 
about the actual virus itself because I think there's a lot of confusion out there uh, and a lot of different information coming from a lot of different sources. Uh, my recommendation to you is if you want to find out more about these things, go do a, to a site like the CDC or John Hopkins University or any sort of medical center that's actually doing uh, work or has a virology or an epidemiology program, okay? Um, I know there's a big tendency out there, you know, we'll hear things like, you know, well, my cousin Janet knows a woman that works in a hospital and does this and does that. Your cousin Janet is not an expert on virology or epidemiology. She's probably makes a great green bean casserole, so consult her about that. But when it comes to things like virology, epidemiology, coronavirus, go check out the site of an expert. Okay, so a lot of different types of information out there. I want to just cover some of the basics with you. So what is coronavirus? Well, coronavirus is a class, okay, a class of viruses. And the one that we're talking about now, we've coined that as a novel coronavirus. Novel meaning new, all right? When I say novel, it means new. Not a novel like Lord of the Rings, but novel meaning new. It's a new virus, a novel coronavirus. There are thousands and thousands of coronaviruses. This is a new one that we've never seen. Why is that important? Well, the reason that's important is because if it's a novel virus, it means nobody, nobody has immunity to it, and everybody can catch it. Now, I'm sure some people have said, like, oh, well, it's just like the flu. It's not like the flu at all. Everybody gets the flu for the first time, and then when you get flu for the first time, that flu will mutate. And the next year when you get the flu, it may hit you just as hard or maybe not as hard because you build up antibodies. One way you can increase those antibodies is by getting a flu shot. That's why they tell people, hey, get a flu shot. It will help. Even if you get sick, you'll get better faster. All right? And a lot of people do and a lot of people don't. But everybody builds up some sort of immunity just based on being exposed to the flu at some point in your life. If it's a novel coronavirus, that means it's new. And if it's new, that means nobody, nobody has antibodies against it, meaning everybody's going to catch it. Thus, one big difference between coronavirus and the flu is that everybody is susceptible to it. Now, granted, it will affect some people more than others. And a lot of people get hospitalized. About 80%, they'll ride it out at home, meaning they have minor symptoms. Minor symptoms mean you're not hospitalized. Doesn't mean you're not going to suffer at home. At home, you're going to feel terrible. But you're at home. You're not tying up hospital resources. The other 20%, that have to go to the hospital, out of those, a great deal, and you know, we look at statistics all the time, and it's not just an old people virus. It is also a young people virus. So young and old both get it. Young and old alike are on respirators and ventilators. But it does have a higher, deca higher casualty rate with the elderly, all right? It also has a higher casualty rate with people that have pre-existing conditions. But we've also had a fair amount of people have died that are in very healthy, in great shape, eat right, don't smoke. All the things that you think, oh, I lead a very healthy lifestyle. I shouldn't have any issues with this. But it's still affecting them. So what exactly is the virus? Well, the virus, it's not a living organism, okay? It's a protein molecule. And it's a protein molecule that is protected by a layer of fat, okay?
Okay, that layer of fat or a lipid covers that molecule and that's what keeps it safe. It enters the body, it gets caught in your nose, in your mouth, in your eyes, it enters somehow and once it does it mutates into an aggressor and a multiplier cell and what happens is it goes into your lungs and that is where it does its damage. It's a very, very, very aggressive virus. Now, since it's a virus, and since it's a protein molecule, okay, it can't be killed. It just decays on its own. That, de uh, that degradation comes from time, temperature, humidity. These are all things that affect it. That's the reason why a lot of people will say, well, you know, it can hang around surfaces. It can, depending on the amount of time, the temperature outside, the humidity can all have an effect on how long that virus can live either as a particle in the air or on a surface. Okay, uh, It can live as long as 42 hours on some metals and then as short as like 24 hours on cardboard or maybe three or four hours on something porous, right, like fabric. So one big thing that we talk about constantly with COVID-19, which is its official name, the COV portion, mean coronavirus, ID 19, 19th one, it's novel. Now we know about it, we're studying about it, we're learning about it, so we call it COVID-19. It is a SARS type, a SARS type virus, meaning it is a respiratory virus, okay? It's going to affect your lungs. If it kills you, it's because of this, all right? One of the big things we talk about is washing our hands, right? Wash your hands. Wash behind your hands, wash in between your fingers, wash your thumbs, right? Wash underneath your nails. Keep your nails trimmed, right? Keep your nails trimmed. That is absolutely essential because one place where that harbors a lot of bacteria, germs, and viruses is underneath our nails. So keep your nails trimmed, right? But the reason why we emphasize washing our hands so much is because that protein, you know, it's just got that little lipid layer. So a lot of foam from soap will wash it right away, right? It'll help it disintegrate because it'll dissolve that fat. It dissolves that lipid layer that is protecting that protein. That's what we want to do. Soap and water will dissolve that. Hot water, heat, anything over 25 degrees uh, centigrade, that will also dissolve that lipid layer. Hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer is something we've talked quite a bit about, and hand sanitizer does a great job dissolving that lipid layer. But it has to be at least 65% alcohol. Hand sanitizer, real hand sanitizer, is 65% alcohol. It has to be that in order to dissolve that lipid layer and kill that protein. Now, one thing you hear people say is like, oh, you just wash your hands in vodka or something like, no, 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 no. Vodka is not 60% or 65% alcohol content. It's much lower. It's a lower proof, okay? Use real, honest to God, hand sanitizer. Now, with all of that, how do we protect our nose and our mouth? Well, we have a number of different ways we can do that. Bringing back our friends here, the N95 respirator. So if we look at it, you can see the designation right there, right? And right there. Now, we talk about N95 respirators but what exactly is an N95 respirator? Well, if we look at respirators and we look at their designation, they're designated N, R, and P. An N, an N, which is N95, an N means it is not resistant to oil. An R means it is somewhat resistant to oil. 
and a P means it's very resistant to oil, or one could even say oil proof. Get it? P, oil proof. Right. So within that, we also have a 95, a 99, and a 100. Well, what do those numbers mean? That is a percentage of particulates that are filtered out. So if we look at, say, an N95, that means 95% of those particulates are airborne particles are filtered out. 99 means 99%. And 100 means actually 99.97%. So we call that 100, all right? So three designations, 95, 99, 100. The one we're talking about today is the N95 respirator. Now, we've seen a lot of talk lately about wearing masks, okay? A surgical mask like you see people making on their sewing machine, that's different from an N95 respirator. An N95 respirator has a, an area here, which you can see that's flat, and that makes a seal on your face like this, okay? It seats right up against your skin. A mask doesn't do that. A mask sits loosely like a square and it's tied up behind your ears here and here just to keep it up there. So what does a mask do? A mask protects you from large droplets. A surgical mask was designed originally so that when you were operating on a patient and that patient you cut into say an artery or some sort of blood vessel that when it squirted up it wouldn't hit you in the mouth or hit you in the nose and the face, right? Because that's kind of gross. So when you were doing surgery and you were working, right, uh, and something would squirt up, it wouldn't hit you. That was its primary job. Now, it can alleviate somewhat if you sneeze or you cough. It will block that from penetrating and spewing out all over everybody else. And this is the reason why at first they said, okay, everybody that's sick, you should wear a mask. If you're not sick, don't worry about wearing a mask. But now they're saying, eh, you know, everybody wears a mask because at least the mask gives you some, some sort of protection. However, it does not seal around your face. There are still big openings. And through those big openings, you can get particles of air, and so on. That's why, even if you're wearing a mask, social distancing is so important. Stay six feet away from the other person in order to protect yourself. Okay? So, let's take another look here. This is our N95 respirator. You can see it's got a valve, and this valve is called a butterfly valve that opens up. I'm going to try this one on and show you how it works. So, a lot of people said, how do we put these on? How do we take them off properly? Well, this is how you do it. So you take the mask itself. Hold it like this. Put your hand underneath so that it's cradled in your hand just like that. You can see the two straps here and here. Now, when I put this on my face, I'm going to bring it up just like this. And for this example, I'm going to take my glasses off. So I'll hold it right here, and now notice I've still got my two straps. I'm going to take my bottom strap and put it over my ears and behind my neck. And notice where it sits. It sits on the nape of my neck. So, you know, uh, ladies, gentlemen, you know, if you have a big old ponytail, that's fine. Just lift it up and put the strap on the nape of your neck underneath that ponytail. The second strap goes up over my ears and on the back of my head just like that. So you can see where it has covered. Now, in this case, you can see the straps are crossed. Does that matter? It doesn't. I can just as easily put it on this way where this strap's on the bottom. And this strap is on the top. I still get a good seal. OK, 
Okay. So that was one question people had. It's still the same seal. Now, I'm not done yet. One thing I have to do is I need to come and adjust this piece to the bridge of my nose so that I get a good seal right along in here. Okay. With this, now I've got a seal around my face. This is why it's so important to shave. You got a big old beard or a big old mustache, you're not going to get the same fit. You're not going to get anywhere near as good a fit. So, how do I test this to make sure I get a good fit? Well, if I put my hand over this exhalation valve and try to exhale, I'll feel the mask will puff out. If I put my hands over the mask itself and try to breathe in, I'll feel the mask collapse, and that means that I've got a good seal. So this is how we wear an N95 respirator. Now I'm good to go. At the end of my shift or whatever I'm doing, it's time to take it off. Just do the same thing in reverse. I put my hand here. I'm going to take the first strap, the second strap, and now I'm done. Now, I'm going to show you a second type of respirator. This is a half mask respirator. Okay? Same thing, except this has valves instead of using the whole face piece. This face piece is reusable. You wash it, you clean it, you dry it, and you put it back together. The difference is this has screw-on cartridges. These cartridges screw on and they hold a filter. This is the inhalation valve here. You can see how it opens up and how it closes. And this is the exhalation valve. Same thing, butterfly valve that opens and it closes. Uh, it opens up when you breathe out and then immediately closes. It's called a one-way or a check valve. This has a filter. And if you notice, this filter says north. Uh, N95, NIOSH, see the NIOSH? That's a big difference. Remember, a respirator like this and a respirator filter like this, they've got that NIOSH label, right? So look for the NIOSH label, right? Surgical mask, it's FDA approved, not NIOSH. That's a big difference. NIOSH, we have a filter base. We sit it here. Notice it will tell you its direction, right? This side faces away from mask. Here is our cover, which we put over the top, and we sandwich in. And now we screw it onto the mask, just like this. Now when I put this on, I put the headpiece over the back like that, the neck piece behind like this. We adjust our straps to make sure we have a good fit. Now with this one, I do the same procedure. Exhale, you'll see the mask will puff out, and an inhale it will collapse in. Let's try it. Here's an inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Excellent. So with this, you can see I've got a really, really good fit. So this is just an alternative, but every bit as good, an N95 respirator. So there's a lot of different ways that we can go when it comes to filtration and wearing an N95 respirator versus wearing a normal face mask like we hear so much talk about. So just to summarize, we talked a bit about the general requirements for PPE, doing a hazard assessment, and then what are some of the essentials for our PPE that we're using. I'd like to thank everybody for coming and
If you have any questions, please feel free to go to our website or give us a call, and we'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you have about COVID-19, uh, PPE in general, respiratory protection, a respiratory protection program. I also encourage you to go to our website and look at our training. We have a lot of training coming up. We have a lot of webinars that you can take if you're working at home or in your, if you're working in the office, you're more than welcome to take a webinar. And then once everything is back to normal again, uh, we will be back on the road just like always and you will see us at safety conferences, safety meetings, and safety gatherings as well as you can contact us and we can come out and do training at your facility for your employees. Now, if you have employees that are working at home and you happen to be working at home as well, remember, you can contact me and I will be more than happy to arrange a PowerPoint presentation for you in the form of a webinar. And I am going to leave it at that. I am so happy that everybody could come out. And if you have any questions or you want to arrange a presentation or arrange a webinar for your group, please give us a call or drop us a line at labor.nc.gov. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.